Today we're going to be looking at European exploration and also the Native Americans. But before we dive into that, let me talk to you a little bit about the setup I'm going to have for the lectures. I'm going to have the slides here, and uh, sometimes the glare is not great, so I'll replace it in post if I have to. And then over here, I'm going to be tracking the different thematic objectives up top, along with a few different uh, things, so like people, events, trends, and then continuity and change. Now, I obviously don't have a ton of space on the board, so I'm not gonna be writing super in depth. Um, and you probably won't be able to see much of it as I write it, but I am gonna take a photo at the end of each lesson and put that at the end for you so that you can see what I've added. Feel free to keep track yourself. This is just a good note-taking strategy. So these are gonna be the dates for the reading quiz, and I'll talk to you a little bit about them in more detail when I see you. So we'll set that aside for right now. This first unit is going to be America's Beginnings. Couple essential questions to guide us as we move through this time period, which is 1492 to 1607. One, how did populations native to the Americas develop complex societies and adapt slash transform to their environments? And then two, how did contact between Europeans, Native Americans, and Africans result in significant social, cultural, and political changes on both sides of the Atlantic Ocean? So let's first start by looking at the native cultures and the arrival of Columbus. So, First, we need to talk about how do people actually get to the Americas? And there's a couple theories behind this. Uh, one of them is the land bridge, one of them is the ice bridge. I'm assuming you have read or know more about the land bridge idea. Essentially, the argument being that, as you can see up there um, around Alaska, there's a land bridge between Alaska and Russia, and uh, people are just nomadic. They're following food. They follow food across that land bridge down along the side, uh, as you can see, down through California. Eventually, that land bridge goes away, and those people are not trapped, but they're in the Americas, and they follow their food uh, across the Americas and end up in the Atlantic seaboard. Um, so that's the land bridge hypothesis. The other hypothesis is an ice bridge. You can see the picture down here that basically um, during an ice age, you have this option to actually walk across the Atlantic Ocean. And so people in Europe are going to be able to get across to the Americas um, by just simply walking. So the idea is you're following the edge of that shelf, uh, staying alive, and then you end up down here. One of the reasons for this hypothesis is there have been some recent archaeological discoveries in places like Virginia that they found artifacts that are dated and tied to a time in Europe where there wasn't European travel to the Americas. So the question is, how did those things get here? And the hypothesis is, oh, well, they would have been across from a land bridge idea. So before the Europeans show up, what does America look like? And you can see a little bit in that picture there, it's a whole jumble of different Native American tribes. I want to stop this thought process that you may have had because we talk a lot about Native Americans like they're Native Americans. They're a monolith culture and that's not the case. In fact, it's gonna be one of the struggles and when we get to culture and society for the natives, they are so kind of different from each other. So we'll group them in that they're not Europeans, but we need to separate them from each other. If you're looking at the map, you can see kind of color coordinated groups that are dealing with similar things, but within them there are unique tribes. And I wanna be really clear up front, Native Americans did not agree in like joining together forces. That did not happen very frequently. Um, and so while we can see Europeans joining forces, you're not gonna see that happen in the Native Americans. And we'll see how that can be disastrous for them in a little bit. While we pre uh, predominantly are going to be focusing on what is like the continental United States, I do wanna mention quickly here um, some of Central and South America. Uh, these um, cultures that are formed here, we got the Aztecs and the Mayans here in Central America. I want to be really clear and that we're talking about really large empires. It's very easy for us to think about Native Americans as people half naked riding around on a horse and we're like, oh yeah, they're so simple. And that is a justification that the Europeans are gonna use when they really suppress these people, but it's not truly the reality. You are going to see huge civilizations pop up that do all sorts of things that modern civilizations do. And I wanna focus on that idea of civilization you saw in your reading, or you will see in your reading, about how the Europeans will call different groups uncivilized. What does it mean to be a civilization? Now, world history, you should have covered what it is to be civilized, and we can say that absolutely, these are civilized cultures. Um, they have their lives together, if you will. 
Um, they're not simply roaming about with no idea. They have languages, they have religions, they have customs, they have cultures, and some of them actually include slavery as well. You can also see this with the Incas in uh, Peru and South America. Again, these are established empires throughout Central and South America, and they are going to be widely decimated by the Spanish. Now, I want to take a little bit more time and focus more on the American Native uh, Americans. And so what I mean by that is what we're going to see in the continental United States. So our question is, how did geography and environment influence the culture and society of the various Native American groups? So up front, I'm telling you, we're talking about two main themes. Obviously, the culture and society, but then also over here, geography and the environment. Um, and specifically, how are those impacting the culture and society? So what I'm going to do for these next slides, I'm going to give you the location of where uh, we're talking about. This is kind of that color coordinated grouping. What are different types of tribes or examples that are within those locations? What's the impact of the geography and the environment? And then what is a unique factor of their culture and society? So we're going to start here with the Southwest. And I'll put both of these up here. So when we talk about the Southwest, we're talking about New Mexico and Arizona area, the literal Southwest. Some of the tribes are the Anasazi and the Pueblos. Keep an eye on the Pueblos for their revolt that's going to happen uh, against the Spanish. You actually will see some you know, com connection, some fusing together of different tribes to push back against an uh, um, oppressive force like the Spanish. Very unique, doesn't normally happen, but it does happen there. So the impact of the geography and the environment. So they're going to use long-term dwellings that use cliff and rock faces as a way of protecting themselves. You can see an example here. So that geography is giving them something that they can use um, to keep themselves safe. So they're adapting to that. They're also going to farm using irrigation, not a lot of water, so they're going to have to create options for irrigation so they can get their crops growing. And there are periods of extreme drought, so they have to navigate and build a culture and society and a whole, if we want to go here, work exchange and technology around how do you grow stuff in areas that aren't great for growing. Um, they have a very multifaceted society, and what I'm trying to show with that is the complexity in all of this. It's not something as simple as you know, a stereotypical view of Native American. Um, they have a very multifaceted society. In looking at the Northwest, we're talking Alaska to Northern California. The Nez Pierce and the Clatsop are some examples of tribes in this area. Uh, hunting and gathering is going to be the way that they are acquiring food, um, so not quite the established farming that you're going to see in some other areas. They have permanent longhouses or plank homes that they build, and one of the things that you may know of the iconography of this area are totem poles. And so totem poles are used to pass down stories and legends. Um, so that's a unique feature of their culture and society. You're also going to see them gravitate towards more animals uh, and symbology of animals that are around them as opposed to, obviously, animals that aren't around them. For the Great Plains, we're talking about the Great Plains. This falls a little bit more into what you probably have an idea of a stereotypical Native American. Um, the Sioux, the Cheyenne, the Blackfoot, the Apache, these are all tribes, and I'm assuming you've heard probably of some of these at least, uh, that are going to be in this area. Some of the geography environment, buffalo. There were a whole lot of buffalo. And as you can see in this picture, there is going to be hunting of those buffalo. Now, there are some different options here. There are some who are nomadic, some tribes, and there are some tribes that focus on farming. So a little bit complexity, even though we're talking about the same Great Plains, they have the same geography, some are going nomadic and some are going to, going to go more towards farming. They build permanent housing, obviously, for those that are doing farming. And maize is going to be the type of corn that they're going to be growing. This is very significant, not only in the creation of America, but corn is a huge export for the United States present day as well. China buys a whole lot of corn from us. For their culture and society, they have this phrase, well, it's an English phrase, obviously, but use all the parts of the buffalo. There is a little bit of like a circle of life mentality behind this. And the idea that the Native Americans have is a little bit more of like a conservationist approach than what the Europeans will have. Europeans are going to be very focused independently on I want to consume all the resources and use them to benefit myself. Whereas the Native Americans here are primarily dependent upon the buffalo to support them. And obviously if you destroy all the buffalo, then 
you're out of Buffalo. And so there was this kind of respect that was brought into it. The idea being, I am using this animal to keep my life going. I'm going to honor it by not wasting it. So they're going to use uh, the fur to make cloth, uh, to make shelters. They're going to use the bones uh, to make um, you know, utensils or weapons, things like that. Um, and you're also going to see them using things like the skull for religious uh, significance. And so not just killing it and eating it, but instead actually using all parts of it. This is a kind of key concept to keep in mind when we get to the European mindset, because we're going to see this sharp divide between European mindset and Native American mindset. There is going to be migration, obviously, because they are nomadic. Um, there is horses. Uh, there are horses that are going to be introduced when the Spanish come. And I want to point out, when we think about quintessential Native American, we think a person who's half naked on a horse with a bow and arrow riding around. And I want to be really clear, the horse doesn't come around until the Europeans do. This is an example of what they would actually be doing. They're dressing up as wolves, uh, and they're also using bow and arrows, as you hopefully can see in this picture. They use teepees, those who travel, because that allows you to kind of break down your house and bring it with you. Uh, and there are people who are traders. Uh, they're forming these economic exchanges back and forth. My point in these things is those are all uh, aspects of an advanced civilization, not just a simple, oh, you kill your meat and that's it. We're talking about some broad economic exchange. In the Midwest, and we're talking east of the Mississippi at this point, um, the main tribe is going to be the Woodland tribe. Um, you also have the uh, Adena Hopewell, these earthen mounds, as you can see in the picture. That is a unique factor or feature um, in this area. The impact of geography and the environment, great land, very rich food supply, hunting, farming, fishing, you can do all sorts of different things with it. And so you get time to do things like build giant piles of mound, or dirt that is going to become these mounds that are part of their culture. Okay? You have these options because I'm not just following my food around, I have more of an established nature. When it comes to the Northeast, we're talking about the Northeast. Uh, the Seneca, uh, the Oneida, the Mohawk are some of those examples of tribes. Um, you can see kind of these long houses that are going to be created. Um, they exhaust the soil very quickly in farming, um, and so they do have to move frequently. So while we see kind of a permanent establishment, you're also going to see them move around very frequently. Um, when it comes to the culture and society, I know I told you at the beginning, Native Americans don't work together, and then I gave you an example of them working together, and I'm gonna give you another example, but I don't want you to misconstrue that as, that's what they all did. These are very, very unique situations. So the Iroquois Confederation is going to be a group of five tribes that are going to form together, and they're gonna kind of manage each other. They're gonna work together, and that's gonna be something that the Europeans will have to interact with. But I wanna be clear, that's a unique feature of that, as opposed to something that all the other tribes do. They are matriarchal, which means you follow the lineage of your family through the mother as opposed to the father. That's also going to be a culture clash or an ideology clash when the Europeans show up. And again, the longhouses, as I mentioned, and they also are fighters, and we're going to see that pop up again as the English show up. Last one I want to look at is the Atlantic seaboard. This is basically New Jersey down to Florida. The Powhatan, the Pamlico, there's a whole bunch of tribes that will fit into this. I give you a map of North Carolina, and that shows um, kind of the heavy concentrations of different Native American tribes. North Carolina does have a lot of history um, with Native Americans, obviously, as you can see. Um, we have Cherokee Reservation out in Western North Carolina. Um, there are rivers, and obviously the Atlantic Ocean, and so that is going to allow them to do a lot of fishing, some navigation, some trade, and things like that. Um, we also have pretty decent agriculture on the east of North Carolina. So they build along rivers, they uh, have timber and bark lodgings, and they are descendants of the woodland. So the idea is they came uh, <clears throat> further east. Obviously, again, we talked about the land bridge idea of coming down through California and then moving east. So these are descendants of those. I want to take a second on this slide, and I don't have a ton of true information on it, but I do want to talk about it. The main thing to focus on is the European and the Native American ideologies and how you can have clash when they show up. And I don't really have a great example or mindset to put yourself in, but it's very much like if you and I were communicating about um, a cup, and I have an idea of what that cup looks like in my head, 
uh, and let's say cup means something very different to you. And I think we have a shared knowledge of how this works, but when we talk about it, it doesn't actually make sense because I'm talking here and you're hearing this. And even though both of us are authentically engaging in conversation, we're not actually connecting. And so this is gonna be a huge factor in the relationship between these two groups. So I have it broken down into a few different things. One, communal versus individual land ownership, matrilineal versus patrilineal societies, the idea of Christian liberty, and the justification behind this. So I'm gonna add my first thing to the board here, and I'm gonna put it under the trends for culture and society. And I'm just gonna say European slash Native American ideology clash. I'm just gonna abbreviate, to keep it small. This clash between them. And that's gonna kind of cover these things. So let's start with the first one, communal versus individual land ownership. Now, if we look at America today and we talk about our property, okay, I have a house, right? When I'm talking with a Native American person, I'm thinking of a house. Okay, I have a piece of land that is mine. I have paid money for it, I have a house, it is mine. You do not get to come on there unless I allow you to be there. Um, I have a fenced in backyard for my dog to run around. I, I don't allow other people to have their dogs come into that spot and use it. That, that's for mine, right? That's our idea. My neighbor put in a pool. I'm not just casually going into their yard to swim in their pool because, hey, we're all in this neighborhood together. That doesn't make sense. And that's the European mindset. You have land. It is yours. You use it. Other people don't. The Native Americans don't have that mindset. They are much more focused on a communal idea of ownership, as in we have this chunk of land we're all gonna use it. We're gonna work together. And when we talk about our land, I'm thinking of land like I own it, they're thinking of land like we all own it. So if a European comes to them, it's like, hey, let's talk about our use of land. It is entirely plausible and realistic for the European to be like, hey, I want some of your land to mean I want a chunk of it that is mine, I want to build it and use it. And the Native American can go, I'm okay with you having part of that land because the idea is, oh, sure, we all use it. And so they communicate, absolutely, you are more than welcome to using the land. Meaning, come on, dude, like we're all living in it, that's fine. And then you have this disconnect. The Europeans like, oh, they gave me their land. And so then they start taking it away from the Native Americans. And the Native Americans are like, what are you doing? We didn't agree to this. But then the Europeans are like, yeah, you said I could have it. And there's this disconnect. And so, yes, you are going to see the Europeans be way more focused on I want to take things and they're definitely going to have treaties that they screw over the Native Americans with. But at its most fundamental level, you do have a significant amount of this disconnect. When it comes to matrilineal versus patrilineal societies, European is very focused, literally look at the king, on passage through the father. Through men is how it goes. That's how they view it. And look, let's be totally honest. Europeans did not have a great view of women, and so you're not seeing true equality. When you see that in the Native Americans, they go, the Europeans go, that's weird. Why are you tracking it through the women? The women have a powerful spot in society. That's not how the Europeans view it. And so there is an ethnocentrism involved of the Europeans going, oh, you do something different than me? That's weird, you're doing it wrong. That means you're less than me, which funnels into our justification idea. And we'll touch here a little bit on this idea of Christian liberty. And so there is a focus through some Europeans, a, a true, I'm sure, heartfelt approach of, oh my God, if these Native Americans don't switch to Christianity, then they are going to go to hell. And so we need to help them. And so there is a certain amount of people who absolutely were concerned about the soul of the Native Americans. And then there are also others who are like, hey, this is a really great way to assimilate the Native Americans and make them look like us. And we'll get into justification because they're uncivilized. Look at them. They don't even know how land works. They just kind of roam about. They're not tied down anywhere. That's weird. Oh, they track everything through the woman. That's weird. That's not how they should do it. Oh, they're heathens. They're uneducated. They dress poorly because they don't have a lot of clothing. That's weird. We need to help them. And you're going to see this trend throughout American history of a white powerful force deciding, hey, these cultures don't do stuff the way we do. Let's change that. 
And that is going to lead to, obviously, a lot of tremendous problems with the Native Americans. I wanna put up this slide here, and I know you can't see the picture super well, but this ties into the communal land ownership idea. And what this is showing is, this is a Native American um, map slash chart here, and it's not showing like these groups own this stuff. They're showing the different ways the groups are connected to each other. This is some of our work exchange and technology. Virginia is this box down in the very bottom. They're connected in trading with these other tribes. And so there is a knowledge of how these groups are organized around each other and having some of this mutual kind of uh, communal ownership mentality. So this is showing the trade connections as opposed to this is the land that this group owns. Now, I don't know if any of you have been to the Museum of the American Indian in Washington, D.C. I went a couple of years ago, strongly recommend it. Um, one of the things that they have at the uh, museum is these big columns, and they're showing these ideological disconnects. And so I'm gonna throw the picture up here um, a little bit larger so that you can see it at home. And I'm not gonna belabor these points too far, but they're broken down into a few things. One of them is land. Native peoples and colonists thought differently about land, and it shows the different viewpoints. For Indian people, land was the foundation of their existence as nations. It shaped their identity, spiritual practices, and cultures. So land is super important to them, but not in an individual thing, but kind of in a national thing. Europeans, the first European colonists who came to North America wanted land of their own. Land meant personal independence and economic self-sufficiency, which were impossible goals in Europe at that time. So we see where both of these groups are coming from. One is a little bit more national view of it, and one is more individually focused. And you are going to see a disconnect between that. There's leadership. Contrasting political systems gave native peoples and colonists different assumptions about who had authority to negotiate a treaty. So when we talk about treaties being negotiated, the question is, does that person speaking actually have the authority to do that or to make that decision? For instance, if I go to France and France tries to negotiate a treaty with me, that has no bearing on America because I'm not actually important. Language. Obviously, they don't speak the same language. That's a problem. Even with interpreters, speakers, speakers will struggle to communicate foreign ideas. That's another reason why these disconnects are so severe. And then finally, agreements. Both Native American uh, and European peoples had ancient and elaborate diplomatic traditions. Some that were similar and some that were different. So one, native diplomatic traditions aim to establish a relationship of trust that outlasted future disagreements. Successful treaties create a kind of kinship by bringing about a true change of heart in the participants. So a little bit more long-term focus as opposed to immediate focus. European international laws was in its infancy, but treaties were emerging as a cornerstone. European diplomacy focused on bargaining to create a written agreement that could be enforced by either side and consulted if a dispute arose. I am enforcing a treaty, which is different from how the, Europe, uh, the Native Americans were viewing it. Back to the Native side. The meeting where reconciliation took place was the most important part of negotiations. Many treaty councils began with a ritual to clear everyone's mind of distracting emotions and call on higher power as witnesses. Because treaties were relationships, they had to be renewed from time to time with visits, guests, and pledges. Key being relationship, as opposed to what Europeans are gonna focus a little bit more on, can be some immediate situations. We see this even present day. I mean, if we wanna get a little America in the world with this here, um, we see this present day when it comes to negotiations and treaties formed amongst, let's say, us and China, right? We can make immediate economic things that don't actually address a full relationship. Now that is the goal we're trying to build to something, but we are focused a little bit more on immediacy as opposed to long term. Colonists wrote up treaties in their own languages to make it easier for their governments, courts, and laws to enforce the commitments. That's harder for the natives. This gave the colonists power to set the rules. It was a crucial advantage until much later Indians began to use the legal system too. We'll learn about that, but we'll also learn how even if the legal advantage is then something that the um, natives can use, it doesn't always end up working out for them. All right, why did Europe begin and become successful in this age of exploration? Obviously, you have the three Gs, God, glory, and gold. Now, we're going to add a little bit more depth to those of being glory is political, gold is economic, and God is the religious. These three Gs reinforce each other. I want to get out of the simplistic view of like, oh, I came for God, that's it. Like, these all factor in together, and we'll do a little bit of a deep dive into each to see 
um, each specific colony that is and country that is doing it. But they're not just in isolation. They reinforce each other. Your book covers a lot of this, so I'm just going to jump through it uh, quickly. The Age of Exploration. The East initially will lead in navigation and exploration, but the West is going to end up winning. Um, you are going to see Portugal push out to this, and obviously Columbus is going to be a big deal. Um, <clears throat> so this European exploration and land claims, you're going to see a lot of division between the European powers. Um, and ultimately, we are going to be focusing more on the English, obviously because they have a bigger impact on the creation of America. But this is kind of what's going on from a global scale when it comes to colonization. Something interesting to look at here, um, you might be wondering, why is there so much travel that goes like this? Um, and that's actually, if you look at trade winds, um, the winds of the world kind of funnel that way. And so if you were to jump into the ocean uh, with your boat here, and it's all powered by wind at this point, the general course that the winds would take you is down here to the Caribbean. So interesting little uh, fun fact for that. Question here, how was Columbus's arrival in Hispaniola a catalyst for change? And we can talk forever about Columbus and how he should be remembered and things like that. He obviously doesn't discover America. We talked about all the other people that were living here before then. Um, but it does fundamentally change the world. You have this connection between what is called the new world that has just been discovered and the old world, which has already been discovered. And it's this connection that's going to be a big deal. So obviously Columbus has a very checkered and dark history. We're not going to dive into all of that right now. Suffice it to say, we care less about him as an individual and more about what this means for the broader world and world history. Explorers need money, obviously. They need to get uh, these kings and these nations to bankroll them. And the way they do that is they promise stuff. Oh, look at all this untapped potential. And so Columbus's thing is, I'm going to get to India because they got a bunch of spices and stuff. And the only way we've done that before is a land route, and that's super expensive. I'm just going to go around, and I'll get there through water. And Columbus obviously doesn't do that. He ends up getting to the Caribbean, but he still believes and holds on to the belief that he found the East Indies. He's like, no, I did it. So, that, I mean, that's wrong, but that's why they're called Indians, because he's like, oh, we're in the Indies, these are Indians, which is why the nomenclature has changed away from Indians to Native Americans, um, although you're also seeing American Indian um, as terms, but that's trying to be like, well, we're not in India. Obviously, a huge factor um, of Columbus showing up is the Columbian Exchange. You are going to have a huge exchange of goods back and forth. That is one of the biggest factors of his discovering of America. Um, and we are going to notice a lot of, um, you have raw materials going both ways, but overwhelmingly it's raw materials coming from North America going over. I would point out maize or corn. Um, it's not, up here. there it is, tobacco. Um, and I would also point out sugar. Um, there's gonna be a huge sugar production that can happen in the Caribbean. That'll be a big deal. Um, whereas primarily you're going to see a lot of livestock coming over from Europe and then, of course, diseases. That'll be how the Europeans are able to kind of devastate the Native Americans. The rough math is that if you go about 100 years off of Columbus's arrival, about 90% of the Native Americans are going to die, primarily from diseases. So we're talking a very significant negative impact on those groups. Let's talk about the Spanish quickly. Um, I'm not going to do a whole bunch into this beginning. Obviously, you know the conquistadors. You have learned about Cortez and Pizarro and taking over the Aztecs and the Incas. Smallpox, blankets, diseases, we mentioned that. So I'm going to jump past those things and kind of settle into their broader society. I want to take some time to focus on this. This is the encomienda system. Now, if we're looking at this chart, this is society. You want to be at the top. You don't want to be at the bottom. And the question in all societies is who's in power, who's not, but then also how fluid is it? Can you move from one to the other? So if we're starting at the very top, these are Spanish people born in Spain, okay? So Spanish blood born in Spain. So it's this mix of race and location. Underneath them, you have Spanish people who are born in the New World. So they have the race that's important, but they're not born in the correct location. The only differentiating factors between this is literally where you were born. Underneath that, you have the mestizos. These are the mixed population. 
That's where you have Spanish intermingling with the Native Americans, and you're going to have a mixed race. They're here in the middle. Underneath them are Native Americans, and then at the very bottom are enslaved persons brought from the Caribbean and Africa. So let's take a second. Can you move? No. This is based upon where you were born, what your skin color is. This is where you were born, what your skin color is. This is what your skin color is. This is what your skin color is, but also where you're born. And this is what your skin color is and also where you're born. So there isn't this flexibility and movement throughout this. You can see the plan and the reality on this side. The plan was the Spanish settlers were going to protect, care for, and Christianize the Native Americans. Ah, uh, so positive. The reality is Indians have to work a portion of their time for Spanish settlers. They're essentially enslaved. You're going to get a plantation system. Spanish settlers uh, force long labor, don't pay Indian workers, fail to protect Indians, and seize Indians' land. That's the plan and also the reality. Native Americans die from disease and harsh living and working conditions. The encomienda system is going to be ended after the clergy protest and Native Americans revolt. Um, and abuses, though, will still continue. So there are some small changes, but not really a ton of significant changes. I want to mention De Las Casas in this. Here is a voice at the time who is like, hey, what we're doing right now is wrong. Um, now, before I get into his, like, we'll say the positives, right? Him being like, hey, we're treating them wrong. I do want to couch this in. These are his goals. One, Native Americans need to learn our language. Two, they need to convert to our religion. And three, they need to pay us money in taxes. So I don't want this to seem like, oh, he's just such a great guy. This is still, to some extent, exploiting the Native Americans. However, he also does point out that, hey, what's currently going on is wrong. The last group I want to talk about here for today are the French and the Dutch. We are going to see some compare and contrast that we can do between them, with themselves, and obviously with the Spanish. Um, and so when we're looking at this, the French are primarily going to be settling up in like Canada-ish area, down the Mississippi River and into Louisiana. And they're focusing on fur trading. They don't want to settle, they're just trying to make some money. And there is going to be a certain level of interrelationship between the French and the Native Americans. Now I wanna be clear, this is gonna be a little bit more positive for the natives than the Spanish were. The Spanish were, let's explo exploit your labor because we can grow stuff here. The French really can't grow stuff in Canada, and so it's how are you gonna make money? All right, well, fur trading. Now, they still are gonna exploit, and I'll put that in quotes, because maybe not fully, the Native Americans, and that's, well, we need their help in fur trading. Well, if I enslave them, they're not gonna show me where to find these animals, and I have to then send them out to do fur trapping, and so they'd have to come back. And so what they do is build a relationship built on mutual trade. All right, it's important to me that you as the Native American show me where to go or help me acquire these furs so I will trade with you to build that. And so I'm not trying to say that the French are inherently better people than the Spanish. They just simply, well, in order to make money, we need to be nice to the natives. And in Spanish it was, well, in order to make money, we need to suppress the natives. And that's why they do those things. Not because one group is wholeheartedly better than another. And then for the Dutch, really it's just trading in general. Uh, we're going to focus a little bit more about them as we get more into like New York and Pennsylvania and things like that. Uh, but the focus for them is I want to be a trading center and that means you need to have good relationships with people, otherwise you can't trade. An example I'll always use is if you were opening a grocery store, you wouldn't make a rule that says in order to buy from the store you need to be above the height of six feet. Because, well now you're just telling people I don't want your money, which is not how businesses make money. So the key for today that we've seen, Native Americans are not a monolithic culture. They are unique and they are civilized. They were multifaceted. There are also a lot of disconnects between their ideology and the ideology of the Europeans that didn't mesh well, which led to problems. You also had Europeans who were hell bent on making money any which way they could. And that could either lead to them being nice to the natives or to using the Native Americans. And you're also going to see that society is gonna be placing at the top Europeans and not Native Americans. 